The gospel we just heard is one of those that most of us probably wish wasn't there. Doesn't sound good at all. And Jesus says, do you think I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. That doesn't sound like fun at all. And yet, you pick up the, you pick up the, the whole train of what's going on here. Jesus is under a fair amount of stress, right? I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He knows when he gets there he's going to die. And, you know, he came with this message of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God and that the world could be transformed, would be transformed through God's power and our willingness to accept God's kingdom. And only half of that was happening. God's power was breaking through into the world, and yet for many people, they weren't willing to accept it. Didn't even recognize it. And you could see how frustrated he, he was, you know. If, it's, uh, if, you see, if you see a cloud rising in the west, you know it's going to rain. If you see the south wind, you know it's going to be hot. You can read that, but you can't see what's going on despite all the word you know, the law and the prophets and everything that had talked about what God intended, they could not see it. And that people would be divided, even within the family, over who is Jesus? What is God calling me to do? Of course, 2,000 years later, what we find is that dynamic is still going on. We still have a hard time trying to figure out what the kingdom of God is all about, what Jesus is all about, what the message is all about. And yes, it will even fall right into the middle of a family. Just, uh, just this weekend, uh, through the glories of Facebook, my, my, my cousin and I got into a little thing. He's, he's not a churchgoer, never has been. And, um, and so yes, we were arguing about the meaning and morality of what was going on in the world. But I want to also bring out then that other reading, the one we had from Hebrews, because it may be instructive to how to deal with this. Now, the letter to the Hebrews is an interesting book in the New Testament because it's, we don't know who wrote it. The author was lost a long time ago. The appearance is, though, it was actually, it's not so much a letter as a sermon. A sermon written by the pastor of a church. The, sermon, the pastor is somehow separated from the church, and he's writing back to the church trying to encourage them. We probably recognize that church. Because it takes about 11 chapters to get into what's going on in the church. But you find out, he starts talking about some people are giving up. They're not even bothering to come to church. They, um, they don't know that it's worth even trying anymore. Nothing seems to work. He spends the first 10 chapters of the letter talking about just Jesus, who Jesus was, everything Jesus did, how he, by his sacrifice, he has changed everything. And then finally he gets into in this talk we heard today talking about how faith connects us to this person of Jesus Christ and can transform the world, will transform the world. And last week, you know, he talked about Abraham and, and how Abraham by faith became who he was. And it continues to this week we hear, by faith the people passed through the Red Sea. When the Egyptians attempted, they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down. By faith Rahab, who was a prostitute, in, um, uh, in Jericho was saved because she, she helped God's people and she was faithful. And he goes on and on about people of faith, how what great things they had done through God with God's might and arm. But then he takes, it takes a turn. He goes, 
Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging, even chains and imprisonment. Now that doesn't sound like a glorious thing at all, does it? But he's pointing out what was going on. They did it because it was worth it. Because they could see where God was leading them. They could see that what God promised was there even though they didn't get there all the way. You and I, none of us really ever want to to suffer. I mean, it generally is someone's fairly crazy who says, oh, me, me, I want to suffer. But almost anybody will suffer if they think it's worth what they're suffering for. They will put up, we will all put up with a fair amount if we see that the goal, what it's worth doing it for, is worth it. Here today, I think more than anything else, what we suffer from, and not just, I don't mean necessarily this church or anyone in particular, but we as a people in general, suffer from a really weak vision of what God is calling us to. There are some who seem to think that the only thing that matters has to do with sex, right? Abortion and gay marriage, and that's the only thing that we should care about, as if that's the only thing Christianity was about, which I find interesting beyond belief, because if you think if those were the two most important things in the, uh, in, uh, in the gospel, that Jesus would have said something about it, and yet he never did, ever. We have this weak vision. This was what my cousin was all about. He thought, he thinks Christianity is only about what happens after you die. And he thinks it's kind of silly to get all hung up on that. And I had to say, no, it's not about that at all. It's about how we live now in relation to God and in relation to our neighbors. That's what it's about. And it's about how God can transform those relationships into something living and wonderful and life-giving and loving if we'll let it, if we're willing to stick with it and hang with it and continue to do those things even if we're not there yet. It's keeping that vision of where we're going that'll help us to get there. And yes, it can be depressing sometimes. It can be difficult But, and here's one thing the letter, writer of the letter to the Hebrews didn't say, but I'll say. And he says, they never got their reward because they didn't want to be perfected apart from us. Now, the word perfected actually in Greek is teleos. It means complete. They didn't want to reach the end, the final goal, without everybody. And it's not like they got no reward. Living in relationship to God and loving our, in, 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 in relationship to our neighbors in a relationship of love has its own intrinsic reward. It is the way we're supposed to live. It's the way we were created to live. And simply doing that by itself is rewarding enough. But the full realization of God's promise is still on the horizon. We're still all on the journey, on the struggle to get there. Both Jesus and the pastor to the church who wrote the letter to the Hebrews wants us to know that we will have to struggle. And if any, it's worth it, but it's also going to be hard at times. It will be difficult at times, but it is worth it. Anything that is worth doing is worth struggling for and working for. And the gospel is the ultimate thing to work for and struggle for. Therefore, do not hold, give up, do not lose hope. No matter what the world looks like today, we are still part of God's promise. God is still working in the world and working through us to bring all of that to its completion, its perfection. Faith means that we will hang in there and continue to do our part. Amen.